My great-grandmother was a giddy woman. Wide eyes turning the corners of her face could see behind her. Her cheeks dusted with a fine rash of jet bead warts that itched when the rain set up. Great-grandmother's waistline was the span of a headman's hand. Slender and tall like a cane stalk with a guinea woman's antelope quick walk and when she paused her gaze would look to see her profile fine like some obverse impression on a guinea coin from royal memory. Now it seems her fate was anchored in that unfathomable sea for my great-grandmother caught the eye of a sailor whose ship sailed without him from Lucy Harbour. Great-grandmother's royal scent of cinnamon and scallions drew that sailor up the streets of Africa and the evidence is my blue-eyed grandmother, the first mulatto, taken into Bakra's household and covered with his name. And they forbade great-grandmother's guinea woman presence. They washed away her scent of cinnamon and scallions. They controlled the child's antelope walk, and they called her uprisings rebellions. But great-grandmother, I see your features, blood dark appearing in the children of each new breeding, and the high yellow brown is darkening down. Listen, my children, it's your great-grandmother's turn. Good afternoon, and it's very nice to see all of you. Very good-looking people out there. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michael Smith and Carcanet, and um, we're, of course, celebrating kind of big time this afternoon. So I think I'll just read from my three collection from Carcanet. Um, and I'd like to read my hearty's poems. These are poems I wrote in the 1980s, and I have a cycle of poems called Hearties because my first job after I left school was as a bookmobile librarian. I used, a friend of mine used to say when he saw a bookmobile, your old office just drove by. <laughs> <laughs> but I had a, I, 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 in rural Jamaica, and I passed at a very, when I, when I just started doing this job, I passed a village called Hearties and I thought, one day I will write about Hearties, and I did. In the 1980s, I wrote a cycle of poems called Hearties. And this is the first one. We with the straight eyes and no talent for cartography, always asking, how far is it to Hearties? And they say, just round the corner. But that being the spider's directions mean each day finds us even further away. Them stick we up, them joke we down. And when them no find what them come for find, them blood will say, walk with more next time. So take up the vining again and go in interpretation and believe the flat truth left to dry on our tongues. Truth say, hearty's distance cannot hold in a measure. It says, travel light, you are the treasure. It says, you can read map even if you're born a jubilee and you grow with your granny and you eat crackers for your tea. You can get license to navigate from sailing a board horse in the sea's gully. Believe, believe, and believe this. The eye knows how far heart ease is. And it goes on, there are like several heart ease poems, but I won't read anymore, I'll just read that one for you. But I'd like to read a poem called To Us All Flowers or Roses. Jamaicans have very many strange habits, un let's say unusual habits. <coughs> All right? But one of them is that if you go to, seriously, most of like rural Jamaica, and you give somebody, say, a bouquet of uh, anemones, peonies, no, those don't grow in Jamaica, asters, um, heliconia, um, bougainvillea, orchids, they just say, oh, what lovely roses. They call all flowers roses. <laughs> so this is a poem, a long poem, longish poem about play, and it's all made up of place names. Every, almost every word in this poem, is a place name poem, and this is a very old poem of mine. It's called To Us All Flowers and Roses, and it's my, it's kind of my love poem to Jamaica. Akampong is a shanty, root near Mekapong, appropriate name Akampong, meaning warrior or lone one. Akampong is home to bushmasters, bushmasters being maroons. Maroons dwell in dense places, deep mountainous, well sealed, strangers are welcome. Mino sen, you no come. I love so the names of this place, how they spring brilliant like roses. To us, all flowers are roses. Engage you in flirtation. What is their meaning? Pronunciation, a strong young breeze that just takes these names like blossoms and pauses them around. Turn and wheel them on the tongue. There are angels in St. Catherine somewhere, and Arawak is a post office in St. Anne. And if the Spaniards hear of this, will they come again in caravels to a post office? in suits of mail to inquire after any remaining Arawaks, nice people, 
gentle, peaceful, and hospitable. There is everywhere here. There is Alps and Lapland and Berlin, Armagh, Carrick, Fergus, Malvern, Rhine, and Calabar. Askenish where freed slaves went to claim what was left of the Africa within, staging secret woodland ceremonies. Such ceremonies, such dancing, Ayakumina, drum sound at Market Lodge where we hear a cargo of slaves landed free because somebody signed a paper, even as they rode as cargo, shackled on the high seas, so they landed here, were unchained and went free. So in some places there is almost pure Africa. Most of us had lost though, swept away forever. Maybe at Lethe in Hanover. Lethe springs from the Greek, a river, which is a river of oblivion. There is more peace here and tranquility and content. Maypen, Dundee pen, Bamboo pen, and for me there is faith spin. Therefore will I write. There is blackness here which is sugar land, and they say it's named for the ebony of the soil. At a wedding there once the groom wore cobalt blue, and the bride cloud white at blackness. And there is blood, red blood in the fields of our lives, blood the bright banner flowing over the order of Cain and our history. The Hope River in hot times goes under, but pulses underground strong enough to rise again and swell to new deep when the May rains fall for certain. There was a surfeit once of swine at Fat Hog Quarter, and somehow Chateau Ver slipped on the tree of her tongue and fell to rise up again as Chateauville. They hung Paul Bogle's body at sea, so there's blood too in the sea especially at Bloody Bay where the punctured balloons of great grey whales. There is Egypt here at Catalupa, a name they spoke first softly to the white falling cataracts of the Nile. There is amity and friendship and harmony hall. Stonehenge, Sevens, Doppy Gate, Wait a Bit, Wild Horses, Tanancy, Time and Patience, unity. It is holy here, Mount Nebo. Who falls upon Mount Nebo, south of Jordan, rises here to Hola, Mount Zainai. Paradise is found here. From Pisgah we look out and wait a bit. Wild horses, tan and sea, time and patience, unity. For the wounded a doctor's cave, at Phoenix Park from burnt ground, new rising, good hope, the morning's dawn crystalline at Cape Clare. It is good for brethren and sisters to dwell together in unity. Upon Mount Pleasant, Dr. Breezes issue from the side of the sea across parishes named for saints. Rivers can be tied together in eight. Mountains are lapis lazuli or sapphire, impossibly blue. And rivers wag their waters or flow black or white or milk. And the fish rivers do contain and will yield up good eating fish. O oh heart, when some nights you cannot sleep, for wondering why you have been charged to keep some things of which you cannot speak, think what release will mean when your name is changed to tranquility. I, I was born at Lyme, Jubilee, on the anniversary of Emancipation Day. And I recite these names in a rosary, and I speak them when I pray, for hearties, which is my Mecca, I, Jamaica. I read from the second collection. One of the things that Jamaica's Jamaica or the Caribbean does not get enough credit for is religious tolerance. If you, there, every, there's every single religion in the world represented. Isn't that true? That's just in, in the Caribbean, and they all exist side by side with absolutely no friction. Um, I, had a, I had an uncle, I won't go into it, but he, he joined every single religion in the world. That, in, no, he just went from one to the other to the other. The only one he didn't join was the Roman Catholic religion. I don't know why. He died as a Christadelphian. You ever heard of the Christadelphians? They're Christians from Philadelphia, I think. 
And by that time, nobody was with him. He was on his own when he got in prison. <laughs> anyway, I, I'll just read this poem. It's called The Wandering Jew and the Arab Merchant on the Island of Old Spice. And that's another thing. When we were growing up in the Caribbean, most of us had no idea that there was any great difference between Jews and Arabs. We called all of them Syrians. Well, you could say we're ignorant people, but they, a lot of them just, you know, in, in the Caribbean, Jews and Arabs intermarry. This is not true. They intermarry and they, they exist very peacefully, as far as I know. And the other thing about the poem is that there was a time when the island of Jamaica produced almost all the world's all spice. Along the road, we passed the wandering Jew in his dark suit, his cart piled with dry goods. Further along, we sighted the Arab merchant, his wares rising from his back in a camel hump. At our roses, good for your noses, come to you from me and Moses. Buy your perfume pressed from those fragrant rose blossoms of Lebanon. All the way along the Damascus road, the Jew has come to sell his things to the freed Africans. The Arab came following the long spice route to this island of all spice. Shalom and salam become salo on the tongues of the Africans. They were known those days to find themselves, the Arab and the Jew, in the same free village on the same day, peddling their similar wares. And in the village square, they would sit at noon under the broad shade of old lignum vitae trees and break bread together, unbraid hala, share Aish or Syrian bread. Aish ancient name for both bread and humanity. They'd sit, eat, and remark how some hard pay Africans do not like to part with silver, and how they both tread the walk through the cockpit country. And the Arab gave the Jew a chip from the Kaaba to protect him in the valley of the shadow. And the Jew gave the Arab an amulet shaped like Moses' tablet. And to the Africans, they both sell Bibles. Then all blessed Father Abraham, before taking to the hill and gully roads across this island of all spice. This next poem is called Passing the Grace Vessels of Calabash. I'll just read two of them together, and the other one is called Who Was the Mother of Jamaican Art? I'm a painter by training. Um, I do the covers of my books, these are my paintings. And <clears throat> sometimes we weren't, we, we have had to put up with various things. I've been saying, that there was no art in the Caribbean until people trained in Europe came and showed us how to make art. And of course we're saying no. And one of the examples, proof of that is that on a, one of the few things that every single person, enslaved person had as a, as a material possession was a calabash. It's a gourd out of which you ate and drank and you did, you know, libations and stuff with it. But almost all these gourds had carvings on the side. So, you know, that's our that's material evidence. Also, and the second one is, is very heartrending for me. Apparently, what would happen when enslaved women had their children sold away from them, which it did? One of the things, you know, I always tell my students, no matter what happens to you in life, you can make some sort of gesture that says, I am a human being. And what these women would do is that they would make little, these little carvings representing the babies that were sold, in, sold away from them, and then wear them on a rope around their necks, and before they ate, they would symbolically offer the babies something to eat, or both. Anyway, so this is called Passing the Grace Vessels of Calabash, and so who was the mother of Jamaican art? Passing the Grace Vessels of Calabash are four parents carved on, lest they forget, Maps, totems, symbols, and secret names, creating art when some would claim we existed in beast state. Every Negro in slavery days had their own hand engraved calabash. So they drink water from grace vessels, their lips kissing lines of maps leading back to Africa, to villages where relatives waited for years before they destroyed the cooking pots of the ones who crossed. So who was the mother of Jamaican art? She was the first nameless woman who created images of her children sold away from her. <clears throat> she suspended those good babies from a rope around her neck. Before she ate, she fed them, touched bits of pounded yam and plantains to see lips, always urged them to sip water. She carved them of heartwood, 
Teeth and nails were her first tools. Later, she wielded a blunt blade. Her spit cleaned face and limbs, the pitch oil of her skin burnished. And when woodworms bored into their bellies, she warm cast her oil and they purged. She learned her art by breaking hard rock stones and she did not sign her work. <clears throat> I just like to read an elegy for my cousin Joan. It's called rights. And one of the things about my family, I've come from a huge family, but you don't have all day for me to stand here and tell you about it. I have eight siblings, and my mother had many siblings as well. And some of them emigrated to Canada in the 1930s. God knows how they did it. Can you imagine leaving Jamaica and going to Canada in the 1930s? Anyway, but they did. So I have a whole branch of my family in Canada. And my cousin Joan lived and died in Cambridge, we were about the same age, and it was very traumatic for me. So I used to go to Sarah in the hospital, and um, it's called Rights. Um, it, 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 I'll just read the poem, all right? Rights. Past the drumhill of Badlands and Sylvan Lake, the shaman came at dawn by way of red deer, and made for the foothills, where he rattled bones in a bladder pouch, built fire in a smudge pot, and washed her in sweet grass smoke to no avail. And his special rights could have been transferred for me to become a Blackfoot medicine woman, skilled in the use of puffballs to stem hemorrhage and the administration of mind clearing bulbs, beaten off branches just after the fall frost. Had I been made honorary blood or pecan dancer, in a jingle dress trimmed with copper tinkling cones to sound scatter for crabs, I would have doctored and danced. Instead, I stood by the window and watched her go the way of the great female buffaloes at head smashed in jump. Those matriarchal leaders of herds with wild bangs of coarse black hair and dowager humps she and I dreaded we'd inherit. We thought we had more time. Reads a caption in an exhibition on Plains Indians at the Glenbow Museum. And we thought we had more time. I want to just read up my, my I just did the music guys. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I, I, I'm quite, I've lived a long life. But I once, when I was at art school in New York, I, I worked in a cinema which doesn't exist anymore, so old. But I was, I swear to you, I was one, and I saw Charlie Mingus walking up the street one night. It was big. So it's called, I, this is the poem it's called, I saw Charlie, Charles Mingus. I saw, that's not a thing, he was as high as he was wide. He was the most amazing looking guy. He was like that, but he was great. I saw Charles Mingus. There went Charles Mingus, high as he was wide, moving stately galleon up Fifth Avenue. Tall Valkyrie blonde woman, heart side. The chain sides crossed over on approaching the new school. It was cold. How did I see Charles Mingus pass? I cashiered at Rugoff Fifth Avenue between 12th and 13th Street after classes at the Art Students League and one extra A train token busted my budget. But you don't want to hear that. <laughs> to you, I'm an upstart allowed it through the tradesperson's entrance. True that. But the point is, I did see Mingus walking as I cashiered. Master Akira Kurosawa, green. That's another thing, I'm a big fan of Akira Kurosawa's work. Yeah. Okay, um, I'll just read from the new book. How much time do I have? I'm done now? Listen. How much time do I have? Five minutes. Five minutes? Oh my, I'm sorry. Two poems from the new book. To make various sorts of black, According to the Craftsman's Handbook, Chapter 37, in Libro del Arte by Cennino d'Andrea Cennini, who tells us there are several kinds of black colors. First, there is a black derived from soft black stone. It is a fat color, it is not hard at heart. It is more a stone function. Then there is a black that is obtained from vine twigs. 
Twigs that chose to abide on the true vine, offering up their bodies at the last to be burned. Then quenched and worked up, they can live again as twig of the vine black, not a fat, more of a lean color, favored by vine dressers and artists. There is also a black that is scraped from burnt shells, markers of Atlantic graves, black of scorched earth, of torch stones of peach, twisted trees that bore strange fruit. And then there is a black that is a source of light from a lamp full of oil, such as any thoughtful guest waiting for bride and groom who cometh will have. A lamp you light and place underneath, not a bushel, just a good clean everyday dish that is fit for baking. Now bring the little flame of the lamp up to the under surface of the earthenware dish, say a distance of about two or three fingers away. And the smoke that emits from that small flame will struggle up to strike and clay, strike till it crowds and collects in a mess or mass now. Wait, just, just wait a while, please, before you sweep this color, no sable velvet soot, off onto any old paper, or consign it to shadows, outlines, or backgrounds. Observe, it does not need to be worked up nor grown, it is just perfect as it is. Refill the lamp, Chenini says, as many times as the flame burns low, refill it. And the last poem I'll read, I'm sorry I went on and I should have been reading from this book all along, I'm very sorry. <laughs> but, um, okay, book, bookmarks for eyes. This is a poem about, it may be about Lorca, but I'm not sure, all right? Enter the old puppeteer, he creaks the stairs to the upper room where we sit at late dinner in an inn where a bronze bloom bird perches on top of the cold water tap in the lady's toilet. Turn the water on and it trills like it's in a bird bath. That bird should be released over the aqueducts, perhaps to swell the high chorus of swallows in the gilded choir loft of the great cathedral. The old puppeteer comes. He has reduced his craft to two from three dimensions. He sells stiff paper figures with black beads glued on still damp and bulging as eyes. Bookmarks, he says, they will keep reading for you long, long after you close your eyes. <laughs> so we buy a purple one and pray. It will not stain our sincere tries, a clear, clean prose. I'll just finish with a short poem about Charlie Chaplin, because I love Charlie Chaplin. Um, no, let me read a bit. This is a poem, I think I have one of these, it will take that much. When I moved to British Columbia with my husband, was born in British Columbia, I said, you know, listen, this, this is all very, very well and good, but I'm from Jamaica and I am afraid of bears. I do not want to encounter any bears. And he looked me in the face, this man, and said, there are no bears in British Columbia. He told me that. And I believed him. Well, maybe I did. Anyway, but for some reason, for years, I never saw a bear. I was out there and, and, and one day we were driving home. And I looked and then a bear just came out, out of the bushes. I just walked leisurely up. This bear was in, he walked like President Obama. He was like this, he just walked the president. And I can feel him beside me. My husband saying, you do not see a bear. <laughs> and I'm saying, but there's a bear. So the poor was called a bear. Um, there he was, great bear of my dreams, crossing the road just outside Gibson's in no particular hurry. Like a long-legged pigeon-toed man with a gait presidential, bopping, cool, bear just ambled, slightly shambolic, dipped in front of the car. My heart leapt. You, love, were hoping I had not seen it. I did, but was not scared as I imagined I'd be upon my first bear sighting. Ursa down from the evening sky, slipped through the bank of pine trees, never broke even one branch. For him, the green parted. Last night, the bear was dancing in a ring with the children. I called to you, come quick. The kids aren't aware there's a bear they're cavorting with. But they seem comically happy out there. And the bear tralalad across half one day. And now the bear enters our living room, where a lamp shaped like a horse waits to be unpacked. I show it with a damp dishcloth. It shows no sign of being even one bit perturbed. 
And I'm wondering if the bear is thinking of moving in. If he will sit in our armchairs, if he will eat up our porridge. Good night, thank you very much. <laughs>